Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Alexander. Uh, I'm going to talk about uninitialized memory a bit. So, uh, sorry if it's this guess, probably. Yeah. Nice. Uh, so, let's start uh, with what uninitialized memory uh, really is. Um, it's memory that's actually uninitialized. So, if we create a variable, uh, a local variable or a heap allocation, uh, and uh, it's used before we assign any value to it, then uh, we consider it uninitialized. Um, it's uninitialized as well if uh, we're using it after it has been freed. So according to C standards, starting uh, from C89, uh, this is considered undefined behavior, which means uh, the compiler may do whatever it wants, uh, optimize the code away, uh, change it. Uh, so uh, some compilers really do so, and if, um, even if they don't, the result is still undeterminable. Uh, this means that um, attackers may use uh, such bugs to, um, uh, by, by controlling this memory to provoke crashes, information leaks, RC, RCs, and so on. <clears throat> so right now I'm working on kernel memory sanitizer, which is a tool um, a compiler-based tool that detects uses of uninitialized memory in the Linux kernel. Uh, it tracks every bit, uh, every bit of kernel memory, uh, writing, uh, telling whether it's initialized or not, and uh, compiler instrumentation propagates this state uh, and uh, checks whether it, uh, uninitialized memory is used in conditions or point to the referencing or uh, whether values are copied to uh, user space or data, oh, sorry, or um, hardware. Uh, right now, uh, I, I've, uh, this code lives on GitHub. I've sent uh, some RFC patches upstream, but it will take some time to um, actually learn them. So within, uh, we, we've integrated KMSAN with uh, Sysbot, um, a fuzzing infrastructure developed at Google. Uh, within two years, it has found more than 240 bugs uh, in a very modest setup. So uh, we've been using like 10 machines for that. And uh, for example, KSN use, uses 10 times more machines. So 200 bugs uh, out, out of those are real. There still are false positives and one of non-reproducible errors, but we don't report them to upstream developers. Out of those 200 bugs, 119 have, have been fixed already. Uh, there was one, uh, 21 info leak, five KVM bugs, and almost 100 networking bugs. Sorry. Yeah, almost 100 net networking bugs. Most of those bugs were never reported upstream because the networking people at Google just fixed them right away. 58 bugs are still open. And 61 is uh, are stuck in pre-moderation queue. Uh, most of them are uh, use after freeze, which have been already reported by KSN. Some of them just don't have reproducers or are not reproducible anymore. Three bugs have pending fixes, which means uh, the fix is landed already, but Sysbot is waiting for, for it to reach all the track trees. Most of the bugs uh, that we found are fixed within uh, one week. Some of them, however, uh, take 10 months or more to, to fix. Here are the bugs that have uh, been reported this year. So on average, KMSAN reports like seven bugs a month. So we don't have much data about the bug lifetime but based on uh, 53 fixes tags, we can see that the lifetimes of bugs are almost uniformly distributed within one year and 14 years. The top anti-patterns uh, are below. So uh, a lot of uh, places in the kernel copy parts of struct, uh, struct socket address from the user space but they treat it as a whole struct. Um, also, a lot of people allocate a structure but forget to initialize some of it, its fields 
or uh, forget to initialize part, uh, the padding, which is also critical. And then the structure gets copied to the user space, so uh, some pointers may, may leak. Also, uh, USB, uh, USB code, uh, code initializing USB devices uh, often doesn't check uh, that the read from the device succeeds and it actually read more than zero bytes. So most cert certainly there is a lot of bugs uh, that are still there in the kernel. Right now, uh, Sysbot covers uh, only 12% of the kernel, uh, kernel code on x86, and uh, uh, most of the attractive attack vectors are still uncovered, so uh, we, we have only basic support for networking for IPv4 and I IPv6. We don't really uh, generate packets that do anything complex like uh, initiate a handshake, for example. Sorry, um, uh, there is very limited support for USB for KVM, uh, and there is almost no support for uh, wireless uh, networking stacks, which probably contain a lot of bugs. Uh, uh, for example, uh, information leaks that d don't require physical access to, m to the machine. I also expect like 200 bugs uh, to be present in the remaining networking code. It's un um, sorry, it's un unlikely that the uninitialized bugs are, uh, may disappear anytime soon. So Mateusz Yuchuk from the uh, Google Project Zero says that uh, bugs related to, <coughs> sorry, Bug, uh, the, the bugs related to uh, information leaks uh, are deeply rooted in the C programming language, and uh, I actually believe that all bugs related to uninitialized memory are deeply rooted in C. So what shall we do to never have to deal with uninitialized memory again? The answer is simple. Uh, we must initialize all the memory. <laughs> there are several reasons to do so. First, uh, if we initialize all the memory, there won't be uh, any information leaks. Second, if we have code that uh, has branches that depend on initialized memory, then it will execute deterministically. And third, if we initialize memory that has been freed, then it complicates use after free exploitation. By the way, Microsoft already does this for PODs on the stack since November uh, uh, last year. So, yeah, we're a little, we need to catch up. Let's start with the stack initialization. Case Cook has put a number of, uh, a number of kernel configs under an umbrella. Uh, there is a number of uh, GCC plugins that initialize parts of the uh, local variables, so uh, there are uh, structures uh, uh, marked uh, as user space, uh, as, as being copied uh, to user space, uh, there are structures that are passed by references, um, and uh, finally we can zero initialize anything passed by reference. Uh, there is also a flag called init stack all, which initializes everything on the stack uh, with an infinite screen pattern. Uh, this is only supported by Clang, which is something that we may want to change in the nearest future. Clang can also zero initialize locals, but this, is, uh, this mode is protected by a really lengthy uh, flag because uh, Clang developers don't want to introduce a new C++ dialect. So our goal is to converge uh, to a situation where all the supported compilers can zero initialize all the locals on the stack. In order to do so, we must uh, introduce a similar option uh, to GCC. By the way, any GCC contributors here? Uh, and uh, make, uh, make Clang communities support this uh, um, zero initialization option as a first class citizen. Uh, there's been also a proposal from the Clang community to introduce yet another C standard mode uh, for the compiler which will be just a collection of such options. So 
So we measured some, uh, uh, measured the performance of uh, the uh, local initialization, and the numbers look pretty good. So in most cases, <clears throat> it's almost free. The problem is that we, uh, it's, it's really hard to benchmark such changes because uh, if, if a benchmark like a netperf spends most of the time in the uh, kernel, it's not really representative. If we have an end-to-end -end benchmark, like for example, Android benchmarks, uh, which uh, use both the kernel code and the user space code, uh, then the variance is really big and it's really hard to tell whether anything slows down or not. So ideas are welcome if anyone knows how to benchmark uh, can slow down. The size impact of this instrumentation is pretty low, but um, certain hot functions still need a, ex an extra cache line or two. So the question is, can we do better? First of all, uh, we must uh, use zero initialization for that because uh, the code is more compact, it's faster, Second, right now, Clang is bad at dead store elimination. There is a lot of opportunities to do cross basic block DSC in both the middle end and the back end. And uh, <clears throat> uh, also, FDO and LTO can, uh, so the, the full program analysis can help remove uh, redundant stores that uh, come from inline functions. And maybe GCC uh, is actually doing a better job, so we must just switch to GCC. Uh, for certain cases in which um, the compilers cannot do their job well, uh, there is attribute uninitialized, which just prevents initialization of certain uh, hot functions. So let's now move on to the heap. Uh, Linux 5.3 uh, has two uh, boot parameters called init on alloc and init on free which initialize uh, heap and page alloc memory. Uh, the first option uh, is more cache friendly because it's uh, initializing uh, the memory chunks that are likely to be accessed soon. The second one is a bit slower, but uh, it minimizes the lifetime of this sensitive data. Uh, init on free works somewhat similar to PAX memory sanitize, which is unfortunately downstream. Um, but, uh, well, PAX memory sanitize ha has an advantage of disabling uh, initialization for certain uh, caches, which we haven't done yet just because uh, we haven't measured the uh, uh, security and uh, speed impact of those changes. So initializing the heap is substantially slower than uh, initializing the stack, uh, although it's possible to reduce the costs by not initializing some some places. I just need a uh, better understanding of uh, how how this works uh, in terms of security. Whether we we can trade speed for security in these cases. So yeah, um, it's uh, it's a big deal to not initialize cert uh, certain buffers that get, for example, initialized later. Uh, one of the approaches to do so is introducing a, a special GFP flag for that. This will only work for allocations because we don't pass GFP flags to free functions. Uh, we've checked uh, that this, can, uh, this is an easy way to uh, improve certain benchmarks by just fixing one or two call sites, uh, uh, one or two allocation sites. But such GFP flags are really easy to abuse because um, there is a lot of allocation sites in the kernel and um, they go easily out of control. On the other hand, there is a nice, uh, nice opportunity for optimizing this f even further by emitting a non-initialized kmalloc plus memset and the memset can be let, uh, later removed by uh, the elimination pass in the compiler. Another option is to introduce a slab flag that disables uh, initialization altogether for a certain cache, which uh, will work for both uh, in it on alloc and in it on free. Um, this is easier to set up and control. For example, we can create a list of uh, uninitialized slabs at boot time. 
This is what Pax Memory Sanitize does. So Linus also thinks that opt-outs are inevitable. Uh, we just need to figure out which places uh, need to be fixed and uh, document them well. Yeah, uh, so memory initialization is also related to the new ARM um, instruction set ex extension, which is called the memory tagging extension, or MTE. Uh, it has been announced last year, but doesn't exist in hardware yet, to the best of my knowledge. Uh, the core idea is to assign a four bit tag uh, to every aligned 16 bytes of memory, as well as to every pointer uh, in, in the kernel. So a load and store instructions uh, check that pointers uh, and uh, uh, the, the corresponding uh, memory chunks uh, have matching tags. If they don't, uh, the hardware exception is thrown. Uh, one can think of this as a hardware ASAN implementation, which is really fast uh, and can be used in production. So we hope that people will actually uh, use this. In order for MTE to work, uh, we'll need to uh, set tags for every stack and heap allocation, which is suddenly uh, what we uh, need uh, for initializing them. And um, MTE provides uh, special instructions that uh, perform both initialization and tagging of memory, which means uh, we'll probably have a cheap way to both detect um, heap corruptions uh, in production and uh, kill uninitialized bugs altogether. So yeah, I'm actually out of slides at this point. So uh, if anyone has any questions, say I'm welcome. Uh, for the stack uh, initialization, did you also look at the increase in stack frame size for the functions? Uh, so the question is, uh, did, did we look at, uh, at the increase of stack frames, right? Uh, well, it doesn't affect uh, the stack frame size uh, just because we uh, uh, do, 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 do only mean the initialization, not, for example, um, MTE. So uh, let me explain. Uh, if we uh, initialize a, um, local variables, then uh, we don't introduce any additional uh, locals. Yeah, but the compiler tries to reuse stack slots between different, so it will use the same stack slots for different variables uh, in different places in the function. And actually, when we did the GCC plugin, uh, we found out that uh, actually the stack frame size is affected. Uh, it could be like a pathology of the plugin or it could be a GCC problem. But I was wondering if you had any numbers for Clang on how the stack frame size is affected. I would suppose that uh, for a GCC plugin that doesn't initialize all the locals, uh, it, it could be so that the, uh, the local variables cannot be reused. But uh, in the case of LLVM, which uh, initializes just everything, it's still possible to reuse the stack slots. And this is done uh, at the intermediate representation level, so uh, it's optimized pretty heavily. Uh, I myself have actually never seen a case where um, the, uh, uh, this caused any stack bloat, but it probably could be possible, yeah. Thanks for your talk. Is it possible to turn memory sanitizer into runtime mitigation, not just debugging technique? Uh, well, I don't think so, uh, just because it's really costly. Uh, it requires twice, uh, twice as much memory uh, just, just to store all the metadata, so uh, twice as much memory altogether, uh, plus it uh, inserts a really, a really heavy instrumentation that um, 
affects every arithmetic operation, every load and store uh, in the uh, in the kernel. So it's a lot cheaper and easier to just initialize everything. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, on the other hand, you can use memory synthesizer for uh, different things that w um, that require tracking of certain values uh, from from uh, their uh, during their lifetime. For example, for taint analysis. Thanks. More questions. Thank you for the talk. Uh, do we have time for two questions? Not, not really. So uh, the first question is, y you've shown some statistics on how long does it take to fix the bug. Do you have any thoughts of why some bugs are fixed earlier than others? Is it about the type of the bug or the availability of the proof of concept or is it something else? So. Um I don't think this uh, has anything to do uh, with the type of bug. By the way, uh, types of bugs don't don't really say anything because this bot um, just bails out after the first report, and it could be so that uh, there is an innocent-looking bug uh, which is immediately followed by a remote code execution. We just don't see it, and we report only the first bug. Um, I think. Uh, this depends heavily on the uh, availability of maintainers for the certain subsystem. For example, the net uh, networking people are really responsive and they've fixed most of the bugs within one or two days. And uh, yeah, maybe, uh, maybe for, uh, for some people the burden is uh, bigger and they just don't have time for that. I see, thank you. The, the other question is about the code coverage. So it's uh, also a really interesting statistic. Um, based on your experience with these tools, would you say that once we get the code covered, let's say we have these drivers 5%, um, what would be the level of certainty that the code is bug-free at this point? Like once we get it covered, is it like executed millions of times, thousands of times? I, I'm just trying to get a feel for that. Well, uh, this metric, um, uh, as, uh, as far as I understand, this metric actually means that uh, there exists at least one syscaller program that uh, executes a certain basic block. Of course, uh, in most cases, this, uh, this is not enough to trigger a bug. For example, uh, if, if a bug uh, requires two, uh, two tasks to be, um, to be um, running at the same time, then uh, y you'll need some some better metrics, some threading coverage, for example. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Some more questions? If not, let's thank the speaker. Thank you.